Hi, I'm Roger Bindle and I'm at the Farmer in Green Bay. I'm here today to do an update on the nearly impossible task of raising perch. The yellow perch don't have that great of eyesight coming out of the egg, so feeding wise you have to almost overfeed larval fish. I'm at the farmery with Annie today. The farmery is going to be have a fish hatchery aspect to it and then eventually we're going to have an aquaponics where our fish waste water will go upstairs. In order to become a commercial hatchery, they have to overcome several obstacles. An issue with yellow perch is that their um, egg, eggs come in like a skein, a ribbon matrix. Um, so they're very difficult to rear compared to a lot of other freshwater fish species. After that, they need to get the fish to eat. And the fish are nearly blind, so it's hard to get them to eat. They can only see, I think it's like a quarter of their body length. And to even breathe afterwards. Yellow perch basically get a couple day window to inflate their swim bladder. Now learn about all the obstacles they overcame and how they overcame them to become a successful hatchery. Going. The farmery is going to be have a fish hatchery aspect to it, and then eventually we're going to have an aquaponics where our fish waste water will go upstairs, um, and we'll be producing fresh uh, vegetables for the community. Well, I understand there's there's a lot of issues with raising perch. Maybe go through each one of them step by step. Yeah, so I guess we can walk and talk. Um, so starting, we're gonna we'll work through each system based off of that. So when we get eggs into the facility, they're gonna get put into these tall, conical bottomed tanks, um, and then from there we're gonna hatch them out. So an issue with yellow perch is that their um, eggs come in like a skein, a ribbon matrix. Um, so they're very difficult to rear compared to a lot of other freshwater fish species. Um, they are free-floating eggs, essentially, so yellow perch, they come in a, like a gelatinous matrix that breaks down as the eggs develop, which causes a lot of wrinkles in rearing them. Um, so that's one of the issues, so just getting your eggs to make sure that you don't have any fungus on them um, is a big issue, and the decaying, rapid decaying of the egg matrix that the larvae are in before they hatch out um, causes a lot of problems in the tanks just for cleaning. And then once they hatch the larvae, um, they will, they'll be in those tanks as well. We'll pull the egg ribbons um, pretty soon after hatching starts. The yellow perch don't have that great of eyesight coming out off of, coming out of the egg. Um, they can only see, I think it's like a quarter of their body length. So if a, the little fish is like, five millimeters big, it can, can only see a quarter of five millimeters depth. So we, feeding wise, you have to almost oversaturate the water. You have to overfeed larval fish in order for them to be able to encounter the food. The larvae are going to need to get fed live feed for about the first 20 days uh, of their life. Live feed is very expensive and it's very intensive uh, to do. So we have our Artemia hatcheries right there. Um, so it's, it's a lot of extra. You have to keep your food alive in addition to also making sure that your fish are staying alive. Um, and so that's another big ripple for yellow perch aquaculture is that a lot of farmers and stuff like that, A, don't have the resources to do Artemia or it's very, very expensive to buy live feed and hatch it out yourselves. It's a, kind of a process to do it. Um, so at the farmery, that's why we're taking care of that. We're producing fingerlings to sell to people. We're taking care of the really intensive labor part of the yellow perch life cycle. So people have a premium product. And then from that point, you need to start slowly introducing pellet feed uh, into their mix. That is one of the big hurdles is a lot of mortality can happen when you finally pull the plug on the live feed for yellow perch and they only have that pelleted food if they haven't learned to eat it or if you didn't introduce it to them at a rate that was good, uh, they will die because they just won't have a food source. So that's one of the big issues. Um, the larval stage is where a lot of research needs to be done for yellow perch, on t especially for aquaculture, to figure out kind of the sweet spot on what to do. Nobody really knows. Everyone just kind of does what works for them and 
It's like you can try that out, but it's not really a proven hard method that's accepted. Um, so you have a lot of the basics is what we did is we followed kind of what I was trained on to do at UW-Milwaukee and tried to make it work for our systems. We did pretty good. We did a couple of different things um, to get the success that we have had. Um, specifically, our tanks are a little bit different than what normal people would like to have y'all perch. They're very deep. Most people raise in shallow tanks. Um, and the swim bladder inflation is the other big thing for yellow perch. Uh, that's one of the big mortality hurdles in rearing and tank culture. Yellow perch basically get a couple day window to inflate their swim bladder before um, they develop enough that the swim bladder actually closes off from their esophagus. And so if they don't have it inflated, they have no way to regulate in the water column and they'll just be like a shark. They'll just have to always be swimming in order to stay where they're at in the water, which for if you're trying to produce as many perch as you want, that fish is eventually just gonna swim itself to death or it's going to have to start eating other fish in order to keep up with the metabolic rate that it's using its energy. So what's the process of getting that to happen then? What, what do the fish have to do to um, you kind of just got to like hope and pray that they do it. Um, usually it happens overnight, so there's, there isn't too much out there on what to help get yellow perch to have a better swim bladder inflation in aquaculture and tank culture. Um, well, how do they inflate it though? I, or... They gulp, gulp of air at the surface. Oh, so they go to the top? and. The... Yep, they have to gulp, it up, gulp air and then they'll be good. Once they inflate it, it's inflated. You can um, go down and push them up a little bit, kind of to prod them to go up to the top? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot. I'm sure a lot of people have tried a lot of different methods. Um, and we know that you want to try to make the water have enough disturbance that there's not a lot of surface tension on the water. So bubble, a lot of aeration. Not too much that your larvae go all over the place in the tank, but enough aeration that the surface tension is always kind of in a break. It's always broken, so the fish will be able to actually get through it to gulp that air. Um, oil sheens from their eggs um, is also a cause of why they might not inflate it, so you'd want to pull the egg ridge. Why we pull our egg ribbons pretty close, pretty like a couple days after hatch starts because at that point, whatever's hatched has hatched and whatever has not hatched, I assume is not going to. And so in order to keep the rest of my fish in my tank as clean as possible, I kind of, I pull eggs pretty quick so they don't create that oil slick on the surface, um, which is going to be, they won't, the fish, little fish won't be able to break through that. So once they get past that, then they're... Once they get past that, then it's pretty, it should be pretty much in the home run if you're feed training once you when you bump off the live feed that's the last turtle because some of the fish haven't gotten with the program so to speak um, so you might see a couple more deaths after you switch from live to dry food so which tanks do what in here then yep so this is um so this would be the larval system is what we call it this is where we are going to put the eggs and grow them out through about roughly right now, um, they're a little bit, they're starting to get a little bit too big for this system now. Uh, so we're hoping actually next week we're gonna be able to move them to the juvenile raceway, which is the big oval tank over there. Um, so they're a little bit big for this system, uh, but we can. Can you actually see them in there? Mm -hmm. Don't be able to put the camera in, but I turned the bubbles off, so they should be pretty. Oh, yep. So these fish uh, were from hatched eggs. We got the eggs in April and they hatched out on Easter. So um, they're not even two months old yet. So these fish aren't, aren't quite two months old. They're coming up to it. Next weekend, they'll be officially two months old. So we have a couple, there are a couple of fish that are probably pretty close to two inches now. Um, those are the sharks, that's what we call them. We've got what? 12 tanks, 12 tanks yep. here then, and they're yep. all, how many, you got a lot of fish in there then? Yeah, we do, we have a lot of fish. Um, Any idea how many? We're right now safely estimating about 100, 100,000 comfortably is where I'm like, I'm comfortable saying that. Um, our goal is to eventually be producing 250,000. The other thing with larval fish is that they're very delicate, so you really can't handle larval fish for like the first month that they're alive because they're just so delicate that you, 
anytime you handle them, the, the stress of it might kill them. And then they can't handle like getting netted and stuff like that. It's too rough on their body. These aren't, are these still considered larvae? No, we're, we're, we're out of that. Uh, <laughs> we're, we have fingerlings now. These, oh, so these have gotten rid of the... Um... Yep, so these are fully scaled up. Um, you no longer can really see through them, so to speak. The technical end of the larval period was as soon as the, our fish had their fins were differentiated, so which means you could tell that that's an actual tail fin. It's forked now, and their fins have actually separated and developed on their body. That's the technical end of the larval period for fish. Fish are definitely an inch. Um, we have some that are probably still an inch, and we have some that are pushing almost two inches. So these fish are the same. They're the, from the same batch. So I, when I said our fish were getting too big for that system, we had to start putting fish into systems that were ready to handle fish. So we have moved about 20,000 fish between this tank and that tank. Um, so these are smaller, though. They only look smaller. They're not. No, they're they're the same fish. They only appear smaller because it's a bigger tank. So when we put the fish in that tank, there we're never going to see them again. <laughs> so eventually, next week, hopefully. Um, the fish that are in the larval system would get moved directly into this raceway. Um, it's able to handle about 250,000 fish uh, in one tank. Once they get big enough, the feed, the amount of feed we have to keep feeding the fish is what makes them grow out of a system. Uh, the bigger they get, the more they need food, food wise. Eventually, the circle tanks are going to be where our mom and dad fish would be. We're going to have our own brood stocks in-house, and we're going to hopefully be spawning our own fish. Um, so eventually, we'd be an all-in-house hatchery. Once they get about a month and a half old, they have their scales developed, and you're able to handle them like a normal fish, scoop them out. And, I mean, they're tiny, so you have to be a little bit careful not to, like, smush one accidentally. But um, you were able to net them, handle them. I could touch them, handle them with my hands. and it's perfectly fine. It's just when they're little itty bitty eyelashes is when they're like super delicate and you can't really touch them. You just kind of have to let it be in the system. Well, and I just realized too now, so you've got the aquaponic side over here. Uh, will you be taking perch from the here and over into the... Um, so aquaponics, eventually we're going to be a decoupled system. So upstairs we'll have, there'll be no fish, except maybe like there'll be a small like uh, fruit concept system for like school groups and stuff to see the whole system working together, but um, upstairs will be decoupled, so there wouldn't be any fish with the aquaponics, so um, in the future we won't have like fish with our plants. We'll be using all of our waste, wastewater from down here will get pumped up to the plants upstairs. Oh, that's what you mean by decoupled. So these will, you will take the waste from here. Yep, so we will have a perch aquaponics. They, they just won't be all in the same system. They won't be in the circulating water then. Yep, They'll be yep. in their own water systems then. Yep, yep. So they'll, they'll get the perch water, but then once it goes upstairs, it can't come back down because upstairs isn't biosecure. So we're biosecure down here. Maybe, I don't know if we uh, talked really on, on the biosecurity part of it. So we went through the, the splash pan and uh, washed hands and so what else uh, is involved with the biosecure part of it? Um, so it's biosecurity really comes into like basically what we do day in day out to handle our fish. Husbandry practices are big so we sanitize um, all of our nets and all of our brushes. Anything that we put into a tank gets sanitized before it gets put in and after it gets put in. So if I used a net on the larval system, I'd have to clean it before I could use it in one of these tanks. Um, and it's to, that helps mitigate the spread of something could be in the larval tank system, so I don't want that to get spread to my other fish. Um, and obviously we as people bring in potential risks, um, so that's why we have the foot bath and we wash our hands. Um, we wash our hands after we handle all of our water chemical tests. Um, so we're not accidentally putting a mixed acid reagent into our tank on our hands. Um, so it's kind of just being mindful that we're in a water system, so anytime you touch a water spot and you don't dry your hand or rinse your hand or something, you could spread whatever was in that to another tank system, and so it's to spread that. And then by saying we're biosecure, um, 
customers now that we're doing a, it's a premium product, basically, um, that we have plans in action, we have management in action that is helping mitigate the risk of us getting a pathogen and then the, the risk of it getting spread in our facilities. Danny, could you uh, tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, um, so I got my bachelor's degree at UW-Green Bay in biology. I pursued my master's degree of science down at UW-Milwaukee. So I have a master's degree in freshwater sciences. Uh, my thesis project was on the uh, early life stages of yellow perch and rearing them up in tank culture and kind of some of the different factors that go into successful rearing for yellow perch. So buy some fish from the perchery. <laughs> so buy some fish from the farmery in Green Bay. I'm sure they'd be happy to sell you some. Yeah, buy our fish. Watch the animated series that is going to come out later this summer.